Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's with great pleasure that I invite you to our very first President's Council General Membership, virtual President's Council General Membership meeting. I think we had it scheduled back in March or April and decided with COVID and everything else that we wanted to push it out. It's probably a better time than any um, to have, have it now so we can, as I think we all feel like we're finally starting to take a breath and kind of move into the new year and get back on campus. And so it's an exciting time um, in a lot of ways. And so I, I think it's going to be a great, uh, gr great um, a, a meeting. I think it's probably the most well attended we've ever had. So um, I'm not going to be Donald Trump and say it's the most ever of anybody, but it, I think we've got a good, good, good group here today. So as most of you know, my name is Pete Coltis and I'm a managing director with Alvarez and Marsalis Corporate Performance Improvement practice here in Miami by day and by nights, weekends, and all other available time. I am your chair of a President's Council at RFIU, so welcome. It's so great to see a lot of our board members um, and several of our university leadership here. Uh, we really appreciate your time and, and all that you do for the university. Um, trust your families are safe and healthy um, as we, you know, as we continue to adapt to this new normal. Um, first, I'd like to go over some housekeeping things. Um, this is going to operate kind of like our roundtables where uh, we have a, a series of updates and we've got a chat button on the bottom that we'd certainly encourage you if you want to send questions, please send them through to chat and um, we'll retrieve them and then we'll either answer them through chat or we'll, we'll bring them up directly to whoever the specific uh, panelist is or the, you know, the, the speaker is that we, that the question is being directed to and handle that. You can also, um, you know, because we can see all of you, you can kind of raise your hand and Sandy or I will address you and you can come off mute if you want to answer your questions real time. Okay. Um, so let's see, I think we've got that done. Okay. Um, we encourage you to keep your cameras on. Uh, this is a networking event as much as any, so uh, we, many of us know each other, some of us don't, but it's great for everybody to see everybody. Um, use chat, use the private portions of chat to kind of welcome each other. Um, just make sure that you're doing a private chat. I, I learned that the hard way the last session when I was welcoming like Lisa McGill or somebody and everybody was seeing what I was saying. So de definitely please just do it as a one-on-one -on -one private chat if you're just trying to you know, network with, with folks. Um, so, and now I also want to recognize my, my former friends, or not my former friends, my current friends, and some of our past chairs. Um, I think they're all on. I can't see everybody, but obviously Mel's on, Mel, Melissa Tapinas Yawis, uh, Luli Carreras, Mary Holly I know is on. I just talked to Mary, and Victor Balestra, who's a, a huge supporter of ours. So we really appreciate your continued support and, uh, and, and, and everything that you do. So... I also want to introduce some of our new members. We've had, uh, even despite everything that's going on, we've had a number of new members and we've got some additional ones that are even in the process of getting onboarded. So uh, Alexis or Alex Argaden, Felipe Basulto, uh, Eddie Cora, who we've, we've talked to a number of times, Eddie Diaz, Michael Giro, uh, Enrique Masson, and David Pruno. We really want to welcome you. Um, we are going to have an actual separate orientation session, a virtual one, in the next 30 to 45 days where we'll go over kind of more of the details on expectations and things uh, for you. So, but I want to welcome all of you. Uh, you're, you're part of our future and, and we certainly look forward to uh, getting to know all of you uh, better this year. So, all right, so now I'm going to introduce our special guests and what they're going to be Kind of the topics are going to be giving us updates on today. I start, there's a guy, his name is Mark. Um, he's got some updates on what's going on at the university. President Rosenberg, of course, and he's going to share some general updates. Um, then we're going to move over to advocacy. So I'm going to actually have Sergio Abreu talk about state advocacy. And then we're going to go to Michelle Palacio, um, uh, who's going to be, is here with us to talk about federal and state, and then Casey Stedman, acting director, oh, sorry, Vice President and government of Government Relations, Michelle Palacio, sorry, um, is going to be talking about federal and state advocacy. Uh, Casey Stedman, acting director of the Wolfsonian, will then take a few minutes to talk about our advocacy efforts there. <coughs> then 
we move over to the health side. And we're going to talk to CEO of FIU Healthcare Network uh, and clinical director of the FIU and Tamiami Fairgrounds COVID testing site um, and fellow president's council member. And she's been actually on two of our PC roundtables, Dr. Anita Roldan is going to give us a status on testing capabilities and some of the latest data. And that's always really, really helpful. And then we've got uh, Dr. Yogi Hernandez Suarez. That's a great name. Um, who's Vice Provost of Pop Health and Wellbeing and Associate Dean of Clinical and Communica Community Affairs at the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. And she's going to share current methods to the university is using for contact tracing, which is, you know, contact tracing is becoming more and more critical. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, I want to thank all of them in advance. And then I also want to just let, let everybody know that there's a special surprise at the end. Um, we got a video that was produced by FIU and um, we'll be playing it at the end. And this session is, was originally a two hour session. I think we've got maybe an hour and 15 minutes. So you'll have plenty of time, but this will not keep you over to three o'clock. So please stay till the end for that, that session. So <clears throat> now I'm gonna turn it over to my partner in crime, Sandy Gonzalez-Levy. Sandy, you out there? Yes, I'm right here. Thank you, Pete. Right. Um, and uh, welcome uh, and good afternoon. It is always great to see so many friends. Uh, we miss the hugs and the kisses, but uh, definitely it's wonderful to gather with you, even if it's remote. Um, I hope that all of your families are uh, staying safe and healthy during these very challenging times. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank all of you for your commitment and, and um, what you're doing for FIU, for our students, for our faculty, uh, and what you do in promoting FIU every day. Um, you are the members of our President's Council, uh, play a very unique role in our mission as a university to ensure that our students obviously succeed. Um, uh, our hope is that you take something valuable away from today's conversation and continue to advocate and promote uh, our Panther family within your networks and business circles. Uh, and now it is my honor uh, to welcome our first speaker, uh, the fifth president of uh, FIU, President Mark Rosenberg. Mr. President. Sandy, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you to the President's Council, Peter. Thank you, Danya, and your entire team for, for getting us all together. It's about time. Uh, that's one. And two, there's a, there's a lot going on. And um, I want to assure you that, that for our FIU, uh, never before has our future been so bright. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that. In just a few minutes, I'm going to rattle off some developments and some facts uh, to, to demonstrate that and uh, make sure you understand that this, it is our intent for this year to be the best year our FIU has ever had. And, and we've had some good years, you got to admit. We've had some good years, not just the years that each and every one of you graduated, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but we've had some some really good things that have developed, but honestly, they're the constellation now, the stars are aligned, and um, we have an unbelievable amount of momentum. So let me, let me, let me uh, illustrate. First of all, community support. Uh, it's the highest it's ever been. Uh, the Board of Governors has asked us to become a top 50 public university. And uh, in the old days, you know, the kind of discouraged aspirations and rankings and all that, but now no, they're saying, you guys go. And they backed it up uh, by uh, working with the state legislature over the last two years to get us $32 million in incremental recurring funding to uh, hire the faculty we need to provide the support that we needed and to, to move forward. Uh, and we've gotten that funding, even in the context of the, of the significant vetoes that, of course, this past year uh, we saw. Uh, the, third, uh, the third point I want to make to illustrate this is that never before has our community philanthropy been so great. This year, we had a record year. We raised $75 million. 
Many of you were involved in that and I want to thank you. Um, and we're now closer than ever to our $750 million campaign goal. We uh, still need to raise about $140 million. Like to be able to do that this year. Um, uh, but if not, then we definitely will get it uh, the following year. And as well, our local campaign, you know, in the old days, um, we did not do fundraising within FIU for FIU in part because of our concerns that, you know, that we might not uh, hit the, the targets that we wanted. Well, over the last uh, six years in our, what we call our night campaign, we've raised about $28 million from the FIU family itself. Uh, this past year, we had a 78% participation rate. And even in the context of the challenges uh, in our community. So it kind of gives you evidence of the fact that FIU supports uh, FIU. And um, as well, uh, in terms of the community support, this freshman class that we uh, have, that we admitted and opened to on August the 24th is the best freshman class ever. The, the, with an average grade point of 4.27, with an average SAT of 1271, and with an average ACT of 28, 28. So this is the best freshman class we've ever had. So, so clearly, you know, uh, the word is getting out. Now, now it's true that the COVID-19 has been a very sad situation, not just for our community, but for our state, for our country, and indeed for the world. It's a global pandemic. We've never been in a place like this before. We've never had this experience. But let me tell you how we have responded, and you're gonna get more. I'm just gonna give you the overview, and then I know you're gonna get more from, um, from um, Dr. Roldan and Dr. Ananda Suarez. Uh, in a matter of three days, when we knew we had to make the conversion, uh, we did, we, we converted about 4,800 different courses to being remote taught. Now the entire university is on a Canvas platform, which helped enable this, but unlike a number of universities, both in the state and elsewhere where they had to take extra time, no, we just went and we got it done in a matter of three days. Uh, we then, uh, two months later, turned right around and graduated 6,500 students in the first ever virtual graduation that we had. Uh, and this summer, we then turned right around. We, we never stopped. We enrolled 43,000 students this summer, all in remote. So in essence, we never really closed, even though uh, that was the order in order to ensure that we could slow down uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then in August, we graduated another 5,000 students in a virtual graduation. In fact, our, we had a record year, record year for graduation. You know, we're under uh, a mandate to graduate students now in four years as opposed to six. And uh, we raised our, we've raised our graduation rate since 2009, our four-year graduation rate since 2009 from 21%. This past year, we were, this year we were 49%. And we are expecting now we'll be fully in the 50s and maybe even if we're lucky and we stretch it, 60%. It's unheard of for a, for a four-year uh, urban university public to have that kind of a graduation rate, which is testimony to the hard work of the faculty and the staff on one hand, and then the, the, the diligence and, and work, uh, work of, our, of our students. Uh, so we had a, a record graduation rate, but that's not all. That's not all. Uh, engineering uh, went from 32 million in, in research to 45 million, and we had a record year generating went from about 157 million in research, sponsored research, to $197 million. So, so the faculty didn't slow down. They just kept moving. 
and they've been more and more competitive, even though it's more and more uh, difficult out there, particularly in the context of a whole set of challenges. Uh, we, also, uh, we also produced 62 patents this year. Your university is now ranked 17th in the country in patent production and about 40th in the world in patent production. So there's unbelievable innovation now uh, coming out of our faculty and that resulted in record licensing revenue this past year of 240,000. And um, so that eclipses the prior six years together in the revenue that we're generating uh, through our creativity. And also we helped to create that we're aware of six startup companies based on FIU technologies uh, this, this past year. Uh, last year and this year, I think it's public now, we've been named a great college to work for, which is the result of surveys and data that are gathered by a third party independent uh, 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 agency. And we're one of only two uh, large universities in the state of Florida that have been named a great college to work for uh, two years in a row. We also are maintaining our momentum in terms of construction. If you go to campus, you'll notice and uh, there's a new crane on campus, a new visitor. We're, we've just started to build a, uh, a 697 bed, state of the art, 13 story residence hall that is about a hundred million dollars in value that will be ready two years from now. Uh, we're very, very excited about that. Our new School of International and Public Affairs building, the, ground, the groundbreaking occurred and now the ground preparation is happening. That'll be a second building for our School of International and Public Affairs. And at the Biscayne Bay campus, the new MAST Academy, which will be better than the one on Key Biscayne, the building itself is now being built and should be ready in January of 2021. Yesterday as well, we announced, made an important announcement. El Pañe Hudson, who's our Vice President for Human Resources, will now become our Senior Vice President for Human Resources and our Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and inclusive, Inclusiveness. That responds to uh, the national uh, issues related to uh, institutional racism and uh, leveling the playing field. And we have a major initiative that we are rolling out uh, this, this academic year, starting with a new chief diversity officer. My point is that uh, we are, uh, we have significant momentum. We have significant support that even with the challenges that we have, we, 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 we have justification to believe that this year, that this year can be our best year yet, in spite of the challenges to our community. And the embodiment of that, and this is where I conclude, will be that we expect to graduate 18,000 students in total this year. 18,000 uh, individual sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters of this community who are gonna get and FIU education and go out and help to keep our community uh, prosperous and thriving, uh, even with the challenges that we know we have as a consequence of the pandemic and other issues that we could discuss uh, either at this meeting or at other meetings. So I, I wanna thank you for being a part of our team. I wanna thank you for being a part of the President's Council. You all are, have an opportunity to contribute uh, with your time and your energy and your resources to something that increasingly is more successful, more impactful, and helping our community to move forward. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for those inspiring remarks. Um, and uh, we know that you have another meeting that you have to go through to, uh, but if you don't mind, we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, that's that fine, of course, of course. Okay, so uh, with the my first homies. Question, okay, 
So the first question that we have is how many students are currently taking courses on campus this semester? And when do you think that you would be able to repopulate uh, our campuses? Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing more that we want than to bring back uh, more students and to have more on-campus face-to-face courses. Uh, we have roughly about 12,000 students now that are taking some form of face-to-face on-campus instruction. That is a far cry from where we have been in the past, but I gotta tell you, I'm very proud of our students. We've kept uh, the, uh, I know that uh, Dr. Roldan, Dr. Anenda Suarez will talk about this. We've kept the countdown. Uh, we have, uh, particularly with this, our residence hall students, have had, knock on wood, very limited uh, positive cases, and as well for our professional staff, our hardworking professional staff, uh, we have kept a, a really to a minimum the positivity, and in part, that's because we have uh, found ways to man maintain uh, physical distancing. We've had a lot of remote uh, productivity. Uh, people have stayed home and worked there. And um, we've kept the FIU family intact. It has not been ravaged by this horrible uh, pandemic, in part because of the approach that our board has approved and that we've taken. Did that, did that answer, Sandy? I, yes, sir. It certainly did. There's a follow-up question to that. and. Um, what are some of the biggest students' needs that you see right now? Oh my and how gosh. can PC help? Uh, it, it's, it's every day. Um, it almost really makes you want to cry. That, the kind of hardship that we have out there. Uh, we immediately distributed $19 million in CARES money to about 1,200, CARES Act money to 1,200 students for um, to help them get through COVID-induced uh, unemployment, uh, COVID calamities uh, to their families. And so we still have a waiting list probably of about 2,000 students who have asked us for emergency help that we've basically you know, run out of either CARES Act money or money that we've raised. So we have a process uh, that's uh, fairly transparent, but uh, certainly the hardship out there with 12, 13% unemployment in our community on one hand and um, um, healthcare costs that have skyrocketed are, are unending. So um, we have to build up our FIU strong funds again. Um, there's, we have a, we've had an internal campaign. We've raised you know, about uh, you know, 15, $20,000 already. But, but any support to keep students on track, to help students get access to capital will be very much appreciated. Absolutely. And I gotta commend the Chaplain School. They went out and raised money and that they had, they had two rounds of support for the restaurant community. Interestingly enough, the first round, which went to restaurant owners to give to unemployed uh, you know, wait staff and kitchen help, a third of the individuals who received that money through that channel were FIU students. Because 85% uh, of our students work full or part-time. 50% of our students work at least uh, 20 hours or more. And uh, our students uh, uh, need that support. So, so that would be someplace, Sandy, where that could help. And as Yogi has pointed out, international students don't have access to CARES Act funding. So, We've, we've tried to find a way to help them as well. Absolutely. Um, based on um, the discussion that you, uh, you talked about uh, in terms of the rankings, um, FIU was ranked number 95 among public universities recently by the US News and World Report. What are ways that PC can move the needle and help FIU reach top 50? Yeah, that, that announcement was made yesterday, as a matter of fact, and we moved up 10 spots, uh, which we're really excited about. The key to, the key to moving up is uh, graduation rates, the key to moving up in 
we're already a top 50 in a number of rankings, but for US News and World Report, we definitely, uh, we definitely need uh, to improve graduation rates and we're doing our part, but we know a lot of students run out of gas at the end. Uh, and particularly now, they, they just don't have the capital to continue. So any support that we could get to improve, uh, to provide scholarship support, Sandy, uh, so students can pay their tuition, get their books, get their, 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 their tools and keep moving, that's critically important. I, I will also add to that, that we are augmenting our marketing uh, efforts um, to make sure that we get our, the word out there um, in terms of what FIU is doing and uh, also promoting FIU with our peers and also influencers. And that's what actually also uh, does move the needle uh, for us, making sure that our name is out there and you, our, our PC members, as yeah. advocates and ambassadors can actually talk, talk it up, right? Talk about FIU with anybody and uh, within your, your networks in order to get the word out there. So uh, most definitely. Uh, there is another question, sir, and that has to do with uh, FIU is leading the conversation on the activity happening in the Biscayne Bay. Right. Will what is next for that, and will we continue to host additional town halls? Yeah, this game Bay is becoming a poster child for how not to manage your environment, uh, and um, it's uh, we saw that this summer already with uh, with the, 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 the massive fish kill in part because of the lack of oxygen. There's a lack of oxygen because of the now in the bay that's coming in from the canals, that's coming in from the broken sewer lines, that's coming in from the overall uh, pollution in the community, the plastics, uh, uh, the, night, the, 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 the fertilizers. And so uh, FIU has, we have about, believe it or not, about 65 scientists who do some aspect of uh, environmental resilience. And a number of those scientists are working directly on Biscayne Bay. And we're going to be very, very active in uh, both education campaigns and action steps that we can take to coordinate community effort to slow down the pollution into the Bay. By the way, you know, this has been done before Tampa Bay had the problem. And if Hillsborough and Pinellas can get their act together and arrest that pollution, we sure can uh, for our Bay. But we can't, if, if, if our Bay turns into a sludge pit, our economy will grind to a halt. It'll be, a, it'll be a global embarrassment. So FIU is going to put a stake in the, is putting a stake in the ground on that. And um, we're, we're, um, we've asked the state now for additional funding. On one hand, uh, we are getting funding from the federal government and we are working on philanthropy. It's just a logical action uh, initiative that we have to take to protect our community. And you'll see us doing it. Also, it involves, Essentially, involved students, involved research, professional staff. It really is cross-cutting. And uh, there's nothing more that we, if we can help our community there, uh, we'll save, we'll help to save the economy. I feel very strongly about it. By the way, you know, as many of you know, I, I had the honor, the privilege of living on Biscayne Bay for about 32 years. And the last visit before, you know, we, we did sell our house, but recently, but the last visit that I made out to the seawall and and I looked down at the bay and I was stunned because there was no seagrass. And there had for 32 years been seagrass. The seagrass has disappeared for most of upper bay. And if it happens to the lower bay, uh, to the south bay, then it's gonna even accelerate more the deterioration of our community. Absolutely. Are there any other questions for uh, President Rosenberg before we let him go? Anyone? I'm here, 305-992-4133, let's go. Thank you so much, President's Council. We, we really are, are grateful for all of your support and the good things you're gonna help us get done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your time. By the way, Jose Perez de Corcho, I don't know whether Peter mentioned him, he was a pre helped us with the President's Council too, a lot in the good old days.
Yeah, there, there, there are a bunch of people that we yeah. haven't seen in a while. Right, on so welcome call, back. Sir. Angie, I know Angie is on the call. Uh, Alfie, Manny Rodriguez, Victor, Eddie Cora. Yeah. I mean, Hall great of fame. group of people. Hall <laughs> of Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's right. That's Thank right. you all. Thank you, these sir. Are, these are not usual suspects, but they kind of are. <laughs> <but> yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, with that, uh, I would like now to turn it over to Sergio Abreu, uh, who serves on the President's Council Executive Committee and is our advocacy chair for a quick report. Sergio? Thank you, Sandy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Sergio Abreu. I'm the uh, Director of External Affairs for Tico Energy, and I also serve uh, FIU as your uh, advocacy committee co-chair along with uh, Melissa Tapanes and uh, together we we work uh, diligently with Michelle with um, uh, the, the government affairs team uh, to focus on the university's federal state and local uh, priorities um, so uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody on this call is aware and and prepared to participate in an advocacy briefing that we are planning for the end of September. And this is our opportunity to really get engaged and to hear from Michelle and from the government affairs team about what is, what is gonna be coming up for the next legislative session for the federal agenda, for the local agenda. So I wanna make sure that to announce um, here on this meeting that uh, come the end of September, we'll send out some notifications. We wanna make sure that folks participate and, uh, and are part of that, uh, that briefing. So um, I, I, without further ado, I wanna uh, introduce Michelle, uh, my friend, uh, my, my boss while we're in Tallahassee and, and, and in Washington uh, to help uh, guide us into some of the issues that uh, FIU is facing from a government affairs standpoint and to, and to see how we can help out and, and advocate for FIU. Michelle? Thank you, Sergio. It's so nice to, to see so many uh, longtime friends. Um, this is such a great group. I'm excited um, to give you all an update. It's actually a positive update. Um, it, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I can do so with you know, some of the trying times right now, but um, we've, done, we've done pretty well. Um, and I'm gonna give you a, a briefing on, a quick briefing on the last um, three years um, in the legislative session, as well as, as this year, it won't take long and a, a quick update on what the FIU and DC team has been up to. And then um, just walk you through a couple of um, local initiatives and, and projects that are coming up uh, with the very exciting, and end up and end up with the very exciting expansion of the Wilsonian Miami Beach, where we um, will have Casey Stedman, director of the Wilsonian, um, give a, pre a short presentation on a ballot initiative that will be on the ballot now in November in for the city of Miami Beach. So first slide, please. So I'll start off with some of our capital projects. As the president mentioned, um, we have a lot of, of buildings going up. And uh, from the state, we completed funding, uh, total funding of $38.86 million for the engineering building phase one. Uh, there were two engineering buildings in the entire complex um, that were planned out. And so we have finished phase one funding and we will be hopefully breaking ground uh, less than a year from now. And so those are the numbers where the legislature and the governor uh, supported FIU uh, the last um, couple of sessions. And then of course, the Stephen Green School of International and Public Affairs phase two, uh, the state uh, funded 12.7 million. Next slide, please. So this is new incremental funding by year, not counting the construction money, PICO money. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't remember FIU having um, this level of funding um, that was specific to us, appropriated directly to us, um, at least not in the last, let's say, 16 years, um, 20 years that I've, you know, been around FIU and either working or advocating for FIU. And so you could see the incremental um, change here, and it totals up to about 
56.6 million recurring dollars. We're not even counting the non-recurring projects that came in throughout these years. And so our, the support from our legislative delegation the last four sessions was incredible. And of course, we, we had um, the luxury of having a Speaker of the House the last two sessions from Dade County, who was very supportive of FIU, Speaker Oliva, as well as um, the prior two years, the Chair of Appropriations in the House, Carlos Trujillo, who's also an FIU friend. And so we made the case um, that FIU traditionally, uh, as well as some other universities had been underfunded per um, full-time equivalent student. Um, we pulled back data since 2002 uh, to show this and we made the case and 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 speaker oliva definitely uh, delivered um especially the last two sessions as long as as well as the entire legislative delegation they were aligned they were fighting for us um it was not easy um but we want to i want to formally thank them and if you run into any of our legislative um delegation members please thank them for us because this was a heavy lift and I, of course, want to thank my, my team, Chris Cantons, Lynn Shaw, Anthony Rionda, and others. Um, you know, it was, it was a true team effort working with our board of trustees and our president. Um, and uh, we were successful. So hopefully we can hold on to as much of that money as possible um, the next couple of sessions as, of course, the state is, is going through some tough times. Next slide, please. So just to give some perspective, um, I rarely do these type of charts, but I just wanted to show you this, the change I was talking about, where this level of funding is quite the big deal um, for us because traditionally the the preeminent universities, that's the, you know, in statute, um, what they call it, let's say University of Florida, um, FSU and USF, they get the bulk of the, the funding. And so it, this is cumulative 2017 to 2020. You'll see, of course, the flagship University of Florida with the base funding is about 26%, FSU at 13%, FIU 16%, and USF 11, UCF is I think 6%. And so this was, this was a major shift um, in the way things normally happen. Usually FIU and UCF will end up somewhere in the middle, not with the larger percentage. Um, and then the next one you have the base funding plus PICO, and it's a similar story. So this is this new slide is 2020 legislative funding. Now you really see the difference of what happened just this year. UF took a large chunk of the base funding, 42% of the total recurring revenue for the entire university system, and FIU at 27%, and all the other one, universities uh, trailed significantly. And then when you include PICO, the construction money, we're still second. Um, and then FSU in third and FGCU in fourth place. And so um, I just once again want to thank our delegation and all the members of our FIU community that really weighed in and made this happen. The timing couldn't be better, um, you know, considering everything that's going on. And of course, the base funding from the last two sessions are going, the 32 million is going um, specifically to help us reach top 50, which it's all gonna be put into student success initiatives and research excellence initiatives. So we're very focused as a university, as the president mentioned, and we're really excited that everyone has um, given us the confidence um, to, to move forward on this. And we're already rising as you can see. Uh, next slide, please. So FIU and DC, um, as, as many of you were there for our launch um, in, to open up FIU in DC, we have been really focused on preeminent research, student success, and convening power. Those are the three pillars. And so this um, past year, our advocacy efforts supported more than 18.2 million in secured grants and 68.2 million in legislation to support FIU research. Um, faculty have testified in three congressional hearings and participated in 22 other briefings. 30 advocacy fly-ins and 77 agency on-hill visits. That's a 42% increase. The, we even during COVID, we continued doing our advocacy fly-ins. Um, we actually beat our, our number from last year. Um, we've been recruiting more and more top talent and they're really enjoying the, the virtual fly-ins. And now a lot of those students are looking forward to um, securing internships in DC, whether they're virtual or in person, and we continue to support them with virtual internships that, you know, in, in some cases 
will, are, are face to face and some are, are, are virtual. A student success, like I mentioned, a, we just hit the thousand student mark where we supported students in FIU and DC and 367 who participated in the fly-ins and 95 internships. That's a 14% increase. 19 of those interned in congressional offices. And the Make a Difference Fund, who we've had many of you uh, donate to, supported four interns this year for $21,000. We also have five courses with 78 students being supported up in, at FIU and DC. And of course, convening power, last but not least, 66 programs attracting 1,600 participants and stakeholders. And, and we also supported the university and FIU and DC supported over 30 presidential appointees. Some of our themes, you'll find them to be familiar, are water quality, STEM education, health disparities, resilient construction, and ocean. Those are our, many of our preeminent themes. Next slide, please. I started um, tracking, I asked the team to start tracking where our students are interning. And as you can see, we're, we're trying to fill up this map. I, I think um, we're doing a decent job. There's a significant increase in the last two years. And so we wanna make sure that our students have an opportunity all over the country. We wanna make sure that these congressional members and their staff and, and everyone knows um, who our students are. We have top talent and we wanna make sure that um, they're scattered all over the United States assisting. Next slide, please. So this is really exciting. This is a new program that we just launched called the Hamilton Scholars, um, funded by Ruth Hamilton. And the inaugural co cohort of 10 scholars represent five different colleges. So it's not just SIPA, it's SIPA plus, you know, four other colleges. And they are paid internships or they receive a stipend. Um, we also have them enrolled in an Honors College Washington seminar course. And we, through the Ruth Hamilton Scholarship Program, we provided them $1,200 in scholarship <coughs> awards. They also get matched with a mentor and each of them will be assigned a different policy challenge to work on. And so this is uh, the first year we're doing this and um, we're hoping to increase this program um, in the future. Next slide, please. And with local rela relations, um, as I mentioned, I'll introduce Casey in a couple minutes for the Wilsonian expansion, but we are also working um, right now um, as we speak on the Biscayne Bay Campus Access Road issue. Um, Senator Pizzo and others took the lead in, in, in working with us to get um, FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, to do an independent study to, to look once again, take a last look at, at if there are any other access road opportunities or options. And so they came back with five potential recommendations. And um, by the end of this month, there will be a stakeholder meeting um, where that will be debated and then eventually an environmental impact study. And so that process is as well uh, is going pretty well. Um, Biscayne Bay, the president mentioned, um, we're working closely with the county and municipal leaders um, and having conversations with many of our congressmen and state um, stakeholders, um, trying to do everything we can. And mangrove restoration, we're working with the county to um, do some restoration at our BBC campus, and so that's moving along. And last but not least, um, part of the advocacy initiatives that Sergio referred to, we're going to be putting together Meet the Candidate Forums um, in certain races. And so we're hoping to have that uh, coming your way soon. And, and we're going to push that out to alumni, students, faculty, and staff to make sure that they're aware of some of the candidates and some of the major races across the county. And so unless there are any questions, um, would you like me to introduce Casey or, or answer? Uh, Michelle, there, there, is, there is one question. But before I go to the question, I just want to uh, first and foremost, congratulate you and the team. I know that it's a, it's a, it's a team effort. But without direction and without a leader, um, you know, the team uh, doesn't go anywhere. So I want to congratulate you and thank you for your commitment and all that you do and have done uh, for this university and um, also the, the relationships that you have not only in Tallahassee, but also in Washington and the experience that you bring to, uh, to this position. Uh, we're definitely blessed to have you and to have your team of professionals that um, definitely have accomplished a lot uh, for this university. So again, congratulations and a, a virtual, you know. Yeah, phenomenal job. <laughs> phenomenal.
Hey, Sandy, I also wanted to jump in here just to, I noticed online there's a guy hanging out on the call named Carlos Becerra. I was about to say, can I please get and <laughs> let's, let's, let's call that guy out. I mean, he's wearing a suit. He looks official. Um, he is FIU in D.C. We've had phenomenal fly-ins the last three years. We couldn't do it this year. Um, it's unbelievable if you have the time and can spend a little money to get up there, we will feed you and you will see amazing things. You'll meet amazing students that are in all these appointed positions working for senators and congressmen. You'll, you'll, you'll meet with senators and uh, house representatives. Um, and it's a, just a phenomenal experience. Carlos does all of that with his team up there, great facility. And I remember we, we flew back with Debbie Mukarsel Powell, uh, Sandy and I did, and got a really great chance to talk to her, huge advocate for FIU. Um, so anyway, just want to <coughs> call out Carlos. Um, he's not a shy guy. Shout out. So. It definitely is a team effort. And uh, it's funny, the advocacy clients that Michelle touches on, that's basically people like you uh, and our faculty coming up uh, on any given week. And as she said, you know, we've replaced that with the Zoom, Zoom advocacy uh, world that we're living in. So yeah. And we got, we got to see Ruth Ham. We got to meet with Ruth, which is phenomenal for those of us who knew Ruth uh, when we were at school that long ago. So we got to see her <laughs> the last time we were up there. And that's what led to, I think, you know, what we're doing now, which is great. Uh, so, Michelle, there is one question. Uh, what does success look like for next se uh, session? Defense. <laughs> <laughs> Defense. And, Let's uh, keep the money. <laughs> keep the money. And, and yes, right now, um, the university system is being asked to hold back 8.5% of the total state funding, um, our entire uh, state budget. And so we are making plans to do that, but that's across the board. And honestly, the there are there are now talks about changing some of the performance funding metrics. So there's going to be a lot of defense involved in that because once they start changing those metrics, it, it could affect us in a negative way, and our students. Absolutely, absolutely. So with that, you want to introduce Casey? Yes, thank you. And um, so now I'd like to introduce our director of our Wolfsonian. And uh, Casey Stedman, and he has a, a quick pres presentation on the expansion conceptual plan that will be going uh, in front of the voters uh, early November. Thank you, Michelle and council members for allowing me this opportunity to talk about the Wilsonian expansion. Um, I thought I would start with a little background about how, what got us to this point. Uh, in November 2004, the Miami-Dade County voters approved the Building Better Community Bonds Funds, of which 10 million was allocated for the Wilsonian to realize 25,000 square feet of new public, publicly accessible space. Uh, this past December, uh, the county approached us and asked that we begin to put together a plan to utilize those funds for presentation to them by the end of this calendar year. Of course, we were presented with a challenge in that our current properties that are located on Washington Avenue do not have sufficient floor area ratio or FAR to realize the development that would add the required public space and also accommodate our existing building. For those of you that are not familiar with the, the, the term of floor area ratio, it's a measure that's used to regulate the overall building size here in Miami Beach and in many other communities around the country. And here in Miami Beach, Miami Beach is a bit unique and that increases in FAR do require a ballot initiative that is, must be approved by the Miami Beach voters. I'm pleased to say that we completed the legislative process with the support of the Miami Beach uh, Commission, uh, City Commission, and we are on the ballot in November, on November 3rd to increase the FAR for the Wilsonian properties from 1.5 to 3.25 which would allow us to accommodate the conceptual plans that I'm about to share with you. Next slide, please. When we were working through the, the discussion about what exactly this expansion should mean to the Wilsonian and, and the university and the community, one of the key points was that we wanted to increase the size of the spaces that we can provide for programmings and exhibitions, therefore putting more of our collections on view, and also at the same time creating uh, new innovative experiences and spaces within the building for exhibitions, classrooms, instructional use, digital labs, uh, studio environments. 
We also realized that our building is not necessarily that welcoming as it is. So this was an opportunity for us also to explore new ways to remove some of the barriers and uh, edifices that create barriers to our entering the museum. So we wanted to become much more welcoming and create a presence that integrated into the neighborhood and the community. And then finally, we are the, one of the anchor units of the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that, that is a multidisciplinary emerging preeminent program with the university that is about engaging the, the humanities and sort of how do they intersect with the public. So it's a combination of research and public facing humanities, as well as development of programming and content uh, related to public humanities and creating a learning experience for our students so that they can pursue successful careers in humanities oriented uh, industries such as museums. And of course, we're always making sure that we want to preserve and protect the collections uh, for posterity. The other items that we did consider in this process was we needed to be cognizant of the size and scale of an expansion so that it fit within the community. Um, and also that we were aligned with the historic tenets of historic preservation resiliency that are also very important to this community. And then most importantly, we needed to make sure from a capital and an operating perspective that what we were proposing was sustainable and possible. Next slide, please. Just to give you a quick idea of the location of the space, um, we are located at 10th and Washington and the, the properties that we're talking about are the, um, the Wilsonian itself, the design store and two lots adjacent to the north, which are owned by the FIU Foundation for the benefit of the Wilsonian. Next slide, please. This slide was taken from a presentation for the Washington Avenue Blue Ribbon Panel that was convened by former Mayor Levine, which was envisioning a transformation for Washington Avenue to return it once again to a destination for visitors and tourists alike. And of course, at this time, the Wilsonian was mm -hmm. considered an important anchor in that effort. Of course, as time has progressed, the city of Miami Beach has become much more aggressive in their interest in creating an arts and cultural community uh, to, serve the, to serve the visitors and the residents. So again, we are very much aligned with the efforts and the direction that the, the community is wanting to take related to arts and culture. Next slide. It's a couple of historic images here to give a perspective. This would have been construction of the Washington Avenue building uh, in 19, the mid 1920s. It was completed in 1927. This, uh, the windows that you see located along the 10th Street facade, this is an element that we'd like to return to the building. Other than that, we have no intentions of making any major changes to the Washington storage structure as it exists. Next slide, please. So this is the sort of expansive view of what the proposed con concept in, uh, includes. On your left, you'll see the Washington Storage Company as it exists today. As I said, there is no intention to make any major changes to that property. Um, but then to the right, I'm sorry, I got my left and right backwards. Then to the left, you see the expansion. Uh, we want to make sure that we had a clear distinction between the two, that, that we preserve the historic integrity of the Washington Storage Company, while also allowing the opportunity for a new expansion to sort of stand out. If you notice in front of the new expansion, we create this wonderful courtyard area. This allows us to step back, to move the mass of the building back from the street, but also to create an opportunity to welcome and invite visitors in. For off of this courtyard would be the new entrance into the Wilsonian. Additionally, we would be creating new spaces for retail and restaurants. Of course, we would curate the tenants for those spaces, but we see it as an opportunity to keep the vibrancy on the street and to bring more amenities to the community. Of course, it does have the added benefit of providing us some financial support in achieving the mission and the goals of the institution. At the second level, behind that glass curtain wall, we'd be creating a two-story volume called the Great Hall. Um, this space in its most primary form would be used for exhibitions of some rather monumental collection items, which we can't currently display, as well as being flexible enough that we can transform it into our programmatic spaces. Um, and create an opportunity for programs to be surrounded by the museum collections. At the third level, there would be an open air terrace overlooking the courtyard and the Washington Avenue. Again, another programmatic space. And then behind that open air terrace, at this time we would propose building out a shell space 
that would be available for future expansion and growth as we identify new programs and new funding to fill into that, that area. Next slide. To give you an idea when I mentioned the monumental pieces, this is a wonderful piece that was in a Chase Manhattan branch in lower, lower Manhattan, commissioned by David Rockefeller by a wonderful female artist, Buell Mullen, who also did pieces similar for the GM Tech Center and Detroit and a few other uh, architecturally significant buildings around the country. We see this piece has not been on display. It has been uh, stored away in its crate since it was disassembled and shipped here to South Florida after Mickey acquired it. It's 13 and a half feet long and 13 and a half feet high and 45, over 45 feet long. So we intend that this would be a piece that could anchor the great hall space, much like the Norris Theater facade is an anchor in our current lobby space. Next slide, please. These renderings give you an idea of some of the interior spaces. This would be the great hall space, a sort of anteroom. All the objects you see here are modeled from objects within our collection. Some have never been displayed before because of their size. Uh, I will say even some of the items here featured, their size even exceeds what they're presented at, particularly some of the wall murals. Um, next slide. This is moving deeper into the great hall space. You can see how we were proposed using the Mullen uh, architectural piece, the stainless steel uh, mural. Also elements in here include Dutch chandeliers, which are part of the camp, uh, collection, a wonderful Prussian uh, uh, glazed tile stove, which has never been reassembled since it's a disassembly and shipment to South Florida, as well as many other wonderful pieces from the collection. Next slide. This is an idea of what the space would look like as it's transformed into a programmatic space. It's a reverse perspective from the last slide, but we can clear the center area, move the floating islands of collections to the side, and be able to set up these programmatic spaces, whether they be for lectures, films, or any other type of events that we might want to host um, and have people celebrate within the collection. Next slide. This is an image of a digital space. We see the opportunity to start to aggregate and centralize our digital efforts. We've been very fortunate with the support of Knight Foundation and our ongoing investment in digital efforts uh, to be continuing to grow access to our collections um, through, through virtual platforms. This will be creating a space sort of dedicated to those activities, but certainly flexible enough to be used for any type of informal learning, teaming uh, opportunities, or project development. Next slide. Another popular um, feature of museums is this idea of open storage. Um, museums have pursued open storage as a way to present the, the sort of depth and breadth of their collections without having to engage in highly interpretive plans and exercises and allowing the visitor to sort of explore at their own pace and the, their own interest level through the collections. We're fortunate that some of the, the materials needed for creating this open storage we already own, such as the display cases you see represented here. And certainly with a collection of over, of over 200,000 objects between our library and the museum collections, we have adequate materials to fill those cases and to create opportunities for our visitors uh, to move through the space. This, um, let's see what the next slide is. Perfect. Well, at this point, I was going to end my presentation, understanding that you guys have a very full agenda. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. I will say that in the coming weeks, you'll start to see quite a bit, particularly if you live here on Miami Beach, you'll see a lot more about the Wilsonian, our programs, and this effort, um, this expansion effort. We're working with Michelle, Michelle's team and Sandy's team to increase and then and, and kick off some campaigns to get the overall Wilsonian brand, um, promote the Wilsonian programs, and also talk to the community about this wonderful opportunity to expand the Wilsonian and just further embed our role as a cultural anchor in the community. I thank you again, thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Casey, we, we do have uh, one question for you and that is how the PC members might be able to assist. I know that uh, you're in the process of creating some promotional material to be sent out to um, in a mailer. Um, my, my suggestion for one would be that we also incorporate um, the uh, list of our PC members so that you can send them that information 
They might not be residents of um, the city of Miami Beach, but I'm sure that they have friends and uh, networks, um, you know, people that live in Miami Beach that they can also talk to them about the importance of the expansion of, uh, of the Wilsonian. Um, but with that, do you have any other um, suggestions on how PC can actually um, help? Actually, those are all excellent suggestions. Any opportunities that individuals may have from any members of the committee uh, council that could help open doors, conversations, uh, certainly if you live here in the community with neighborhood associations, uh, any other influencers that you might know within your portfolio of um, contacts that would be much appreciated. I am more than happy to make this presentation anytime, any day. Um, <laughs> seven days a week. I won't say 24 hours a day. I do like to sleep a little each evening, um, but certainly I'm at the ready to promote because we certainly want success on the ballot on November 3rd. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity for the Wilsonian that most certainly probably won't come along again for a while. So we, we don't want to miss this opportunity. We, we, we want to succeed uh, in November. Great. So thank you, Casey, and thank you, uh, Michelle. With that, I'd like to, um, at this point, to introduce Dr. Eneida Roldan. She is our Chief Executive Officer for the FIU Healthcare Network. Uh, so she can give us an update on our testing site and provide some general COVID-19 updates. Dr. Roldan. Good afternoon, Sandy. Thank you so much for the introduction. And Chairman Clotis, as, uh, as always, is a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon and with members of the President's Council. Uh, it's also very nice to see some familiar faces, familiar faces from our community and, and, and faces that not, are not only great in our community, but care so much for our institution. So thank you again for this opportunity. I've been here. I think this is my third time, Pete, uh, you know, addressing the uh, President's Council and it's always a pleasure. Uh, to yeah, you're, you're like a rock, you. President's Council rock star and member. <laughs> And member, so. yes, absolutely. Very proud to be, to be a member of this council. So thank you so much again for the opportunity. So today I want to be, um, I want to frame just one, I have one slide, just an overview of uh, COVID, COVID-19 and, and uh, caused by coronavirus. Then I'm going to go into different types of testing because I know there's a lot out there in information. So what are the types of testing and what each testing does or tries to do? And then uh, the turnaround time, which as you know, we have had a lot in the uh, in media uh, concern with turnaround times of different testing. And then I'm going to end up with our capabilities as well, our current capabilities, as well as our proposed, which as always, FIU has great uh, stories to come and tell and great future to look forward to. And I'm going to end with some statistics of our COVID uh, test site, which is in collaboration with the county. A great success on that end already. Uh, as of today, we ended today at 59,864 Miami-Dade residents tested. So we have really touched a lot of lives out in the community. And as always, Panthers protecting Panthers and really Panthers caring for the community, which is our goal. Uh, so uh, first slide, please. So just as an overview, uh, we all now know COVID-19 is a household word. Uh, it is actually the disease. It is a highly infectious disease and is caused by the SARS-CoV-2, uh, type 2, which is uh, known as coronavirus. We all know the symptoms. Again, that's also household world, word. We know that if we have fever, cough, new loss of taste and smell, headaches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that usually begins between 2 and 14 days after uh, coming in contact with someone that has the virus. Uh, very sad, and we all know this, there's currently no specific symptoms, I mean, no specific, sorry, no specific uh, treatment nor vaccines, uh, except for supportive care of the symptoms, especially when that is treated as a mild disease at home. The more severe cases of COVID-19 that require hospitalizations, we know throughout um, uh, media and what we've read, we are actually treating these patients with the use of remdesivir, uh, currently now steroids and convalescent plasma. Again, we just have to open up our newspaper and look at the media and at uh, newscast and know what is happening with the treatment of COVID. However, these benefits of these treatments are still very unclear more science is needed and more studies are needed. 
Very important is the protection of our healthcare workers. We understand that we have had our frontline healthcare workers, our colleagues that have succumbed to this disease, and of utmost importance is their protection, which is uh, with personal protective equipment. Next slide, please. So what are the types of tests that we have for COVID-19? We have basically two types. One is the diagnostic test, which is what tells us if we have active coronavirus infection, and we have the antibody test that shows if we have been infected in the past. The types of uh, lab that uh, basically does one or the other types of test, uh, with a diagnostic test, we could actually send that test to high complexity lab, which is called CLIA certified labs. Those are the tests that go to the labs that we all know, such as the LabCorp, Quest, et cetera, or we have what's called point of care test, point of care test, which are those tests that can be done at the, in the offices uh, with our providers. Within the diagnostic test, there's two types of tests, which is the molecular, which detects the genetic material of the virus, and it could be nasal, throat swab, and saliva, and any one of us that have had those tests will remember those tests. They're pretty uh, not very comfortable, saliva being the best, <laughs> the best uh, that we can do. It's not as uncomfortable. Results for uh, these types of tests are anywhere between one to five days. Or the rapid test, which we, if those of you that have gone to urgent care centers and have had the rapid test, that's such as the Abbott ID now, those are all considered molecular tests and what they um, detect is an active coronavirus infection. Then we have the antigen test, which is up and coming and has been out for a while. This is a specific test that detects a specific viral proteins. If positive, we know we have the active disease, but if negative, we have to, uh, we have to run a molecular test to confirm the disease. This specific type of test is also nasal or throat swab. The time for results, which is very good, is same, it's within an hour. So these are also called rapid tests. All those of you that follow the news and follow what's happening in pharma, we have the Abbott uh, Linux now, which is a little card. And uh, there's going to be some uh, clinical trials that are being run. And we have the Quidel, which is also will detect uh, antigen in a very rapid within 15 minutes. On the antibody test, please understand that this is not a test to be done, uh, to be administered for the diagnosis of COVID-19 infection. Simply what this um, detects is antibodies, which means could you have been exposed to the coronavirus? Again, not, uh, we cannot even say whether it could be the specific coronavirus that causes COVID-19, but however, it could be other cross um, it could cross over with other types of viruses. So the best time to have the antibody test is when you have had a confirmed molecular test within a negative test and you would run an antibody to see if you have acquired immunity. Now there's a caveat to that. We have yet to know how long that immunity will last. The time for these results is anywhere between one to three days. Next slide, please. So what do we really have for, uh, as far as our exposure or our prevention for COVID-19 is actually avoiding being exposed to the virus. So what do we have to do in order to do that? Follow best practices. Wear a mask that covers your nose and mouth, wash your hands frequently for 20 minutes and or use sanitizers of at least 60% alcohol if you do not have access to water and uh, soap. Physical distancing of six feet or more, avoiding close contact with people that are sick. And if you're sick, please stay home. These are all preventive measures that FIU has taken very seriously, continues to take ser very seriously as we repopulate the campus. We also have, um, you've all probably heard of the P3 app, which is Panther Protecting Panthers. And this is done every day for anyone coming on campus to mitigate exposure to virus. And basically with the daily uh, responses, we do have a COVID response team and a contact and tracing team, which you're gonna hear about uh, with uh, Dr. Hernandez, uh, that they're following these cases in order to mitigate potential transmission and exposure on campus. Next slide, please. So what is our testing strategy right now? We currently do, have, do not have universal testing, which means we are not testing every single person on campus, nor are we universally testing 
every single student. First and foremost is prevention. Prevention through the known public health measures, communication, education, and very important personal responsibility. We are monitoring potential transmission through our P3 app daily, and we do, do screening and testing, and we're going to start a centennial surveillance, which again, you're gonna hear about, and what do we do with that? If the person is symptomatic and test positive, we, do, uh, we encourage isolation and they do have to isolate. If they're asymptomatic, uh, we also do sur uh, surveillance and quarantine. Asymptomatic means an individual that, is, uh, a that has been exposed to a COVID positive patient that basically needs uh, to be quarantined. We do have a COVID-19 response team and a contact and tracing team and disinfection team. We have all these, we have this infrastructure in place, which is, helps to mitigate transmission and, uh, for, uh, and, and exposure to the virus. Next slide, please. What are our current testing capabilities? We have partnerships with commercial labs and our on-campus clinics. And I want to echo something the president said, we have not closed. Our clinics have not closed, even at the time that we went remote. Both our community clinics at FIU Health at the ACC, as well as our student health clinics have remained open throughout. We have pivoted towards telemedicine, however, and we have immediately play, uh, put in safeguards in order to prevent um, exposure to the virus by our faculty, by our staff, by patients, and our providers as well. The type of test that we are running is the molecular test. Time for results is anywhere between one to four days. We're also running antigen and we're also running antibody tests. At our student health, thus far between the months of March through September 11th, we have administered 1,409 tests. They're all on molecular tests with a positive percent positive of 6.9%. And on antibody tests, which we're administering right now, 71 tests with 56% positive. At our ACC, which is where our FIU staff, they go test uh, through the um, March through September 11th, we have administered 439 tests, which are molecular with only 5% positive uh, rate. And we have also administered antibodies with 28% positive. At our COVID-19 uh, Tamiami Fairgrounds test site, in collaboration with the county and the private labs, we are currently administering the saliva test, which is also a molecular test, and that has a turnaround time between two to three, day, two to three days. Other, um, other potential could be through your private providers and commercial outlets, which the turnaround time varies. Next slide, please. The in-progress and proposed testing uh, capabilities include at our clinic sites, we want to expand our point of care testing, which are more of the rapid testing, which could be times for results between 50, 15 to 30 minutes and that same day. And our CLIA certified lab, which is in progress, you may hear some more about it through, uh, with Dr. Hernandez Suarez, uh, that we will be running the molecular a test which would be both nasal and saliva and that and we are focused on a time on a turnaround time of same day final slide please a little bit on our tamiami fairgrounds as i stated at this point i don't know if uh, eddie cora is there i want to shout out to eddie uh, it's been wonderful to be uh you know at the test site and in collaboration with our community as well as with our um with uh, the county and as today, this was uh, back in the closing day, but closing day Sunday, we are now at day 147 and we have actually tested 59,864 Miami-Dade residents and we're trending about 11% positive. Uh, please be mindful, these are all Miami-Dade residents that come from the area of Doral, West Miami, Westchester, South Miami, et cetera. So although we're a little bit higher, than what Miami-Dade County in general is trending, as well as the state of Florida, we are now trending uh, lower than we were a few days ago. Um, as far as the SIP goes with the highest percent positive, we have Hialeah, Miami Lake, Sweetwater, Richmond Heights, and Doral. And these are from individuals that are testing at the site. Um, as uh, the, uh, average re the average daily tested has reduced to about 350, but the uh, capacity is still at 1,000 per day. 
Um, just a bit on Florida, we are about 4% 4 per, 4 positive, downward trends in hospitalizations and emergency room visit. And in Miami-Dade County, we are just about the same, about 4.3. We have been trending in the past three to four days below 5% with downward trend in hospitalizations and emergency room visits. We just hope that this continues, uh, but, act, but we have to understand, as I alluded to in my presentation, there is no treatment. And the best thing that we can do is avo avoid the exposure of the virus through personal responsibility and following public health measures that we all know. So at this time, that concludes my report, Pete, and thank you so much again for the opportunity. Andy, yes, Sandy, you're on mute. So th thank sorry, you, Dr. Roldan. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sandy. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Roldan, uh, for that wonderful um, presentation. One quick uh, uh, question. There has been a lot of discussion about the flu season and um, whether people should uh, get vaccinated. Could you uh, tell us what your thought is on that? Absolutely. Well, as, as in every uh, time for the flu shot, we always tell everyone to get their flu shot, more so this year. More so this year because we know that as we look at the symptoms that I described, uh, they're very similar to the symptoms in flu. So one of the things that we are uh, focused on doing uh, at our clinic sites is basically to test for flu as well. So someone that comes in with uh, the symptoms will be testing both flu and potential COVID if there is a medical necessity and there is a history with potential exposure. So what is the, what's the, the rule? The rule is get your flu shot as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. That helps. Uh, and with that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Yogi Hernandez Suarez. Um, she is our Vice Provost for Population Health and Wellbeing, so she can give us a quick update on our contact tracing efforts. Hey, thank you, Sandy. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come um, in front of what is clearly a special group mm -hmm. Uh, many of you I have not had the pleasure of meeting. Um, this is my second stint at FIU. I was previously on faculty at the College of Medicine under Dean Rock and was uh, the founding uh, um, associate dean for graduate medical education. And I've returned to FIU in a founding role as vice provost for population health and well-being. This is an emerging role across the nation in, uh, I would say, progressive universities. And it's galvanizing the power of higher education to improve health in community. So the role of the Vice Provost for Population Health and Well-Being is to use the power of the entire enterprise to foster uh, health literacy, health equity, and health promotion. Um, and I would be happy to come back to this group to share more about that mission. Uh, but right now it's all about coronavirus and um, we have um, use the platform of the Vice Provost's Office to uh, bring together the COVID response team. And I'm uh, happy to share some information about how we are investing in I, what I think are critical mitigating efforts that are proving to be uh, effective in our ability to temper infection on our campuses and sites. So if you could go to the first slide. Um, if you look at the first Venn diagram at the very top left part of the screen, you see uh, what we will call a typical or destination university and its relationship to community. So if you think about a college like I went to in Swarthmore in Pennsylvania, it's a destination location. People come to college and they stay there. And, um, and this, these types of universities, Notre Dame, uh, University of Illinois and Champaign are examples of these have put what we put call a bubbling strategy around their mitigation for COVID. That being that everyone gets tested before they come in, and then the hope is that nobody goes anywhere or does anything that brings new infection onto the campus. Now, when we think about our FIU, that's just not what we look like, right? There is FIU integrally part of our community within Miami-Dade, within South Florida, within Florida. And so that type of strategy is just not a good use of our money or time. And that's why you'll see that we spend a lot of time talking about prevention and uh, other types of mitigating strategies that go beyond uh, repetitive testing. 
when we came together as an organization, and I can say it's extraordinary having served in different types of organizations before, the brain power that sits inside of FIU is, is amazing. And it's, it's great to be able to convene the type of subject matter experts we have when we have an emerging problem, such as this global pandemic. Um, you know, lucky us to have the type of people that we have in a university setting who are willing to come to the table to think through what we were going to do. These guideposts essentially of how we came up with the mitigating plan that we have. So first and foremost is the safety of our students, faculty and staff. And coming as a close second, of course, is student success. That's why we wake up in the morning is to every day give our students the best opportunity for their academic success. Um, the third one is the stewardship of the funding that we are receiving for COVID response. We understand that that is not in infinite and we want to ensure that for every dollar we spend in COVID mitigation, that we feel that we are getting the appropriate return. And that is why we are thinking holistically in our mitigation strategy and not just throwing all our dollars um, within one bucket. Um, and you'll see how we do that um, in the next slide. The other mandate we got from our president and from the Board of Governors was to be self-sufficient in our response. And what do I mean by that? It's the ability to really take a hold of all the critical elements of the response and not be beholden to partnerships that may, through no fault of their own, not be able to serve us. And we've seen this um, uh, as, we, as we have seen uh, uh, issues within our own hospital partners for access to uh, uh, protective equipment, um, partnerships with commercial laboratories that cannot give us the kind of turnaround that we need for the student success and safety of our campus. And so we were asked to take a very hard look at the critical elements of our success plan and make sure that for the most part, we ourselves are responsible and sit on our own bottom to make sure that those are, are in place. And finally, not to lose sight of the, you know, the fact that we have a uh, next horizon strategic plan, that we have a, go a value proposition as a going concern as a university, and that we can't um, uh, deviate from the goals that we have promised our board, the Board of Governors, ourselves, and our students. And you heard how we continue to excel in those from the report from our president this morning. And so we can't just throw out the baby out with the bathwater and now suddenly it's all about coronavirus. We have to remember that we have to balance the fact that at the end of the day, we are um, a anchor institution. Hey, uh, I got you. Okay. Uh, part of the world. So if you go to the okay. next slide. So what I was asking. So uh, I, this is an overview of our approach. And so you see at the very top of the slide, the most important thing that we wake up and think about every day is the prevalence of disease in our community. And that is because FIU is reflective of that community. The success of our mitigation efforts is measured by, do we have a lower rate on our campuses than what we are currently seeing in our community? Uh, it's not like the destination universities that we talked about. So we are, are bird dogging what is happening in community and we think it's a, we are part of that solution of, of mitigating community spread through the efforts of talking to our Panthers Together, we're almost 70,000 people within faculty, staff, uh, students, and the halos around those, um, their families. We make a difference when we do it right. And so you'll see a lot of effort being made into educating our uh, Panther community to understand how they can take care of themselves. The most important part of that are the public health measures that we've all heard about, the physical distance, distancing, Increasingly, we are understanding the, the primacy of mask wearing free and frequent hand washing, as well as dis targeted disinfection um, when there are uh, 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 clusters of, pay of subjects or students or faculty that are together. Screening yourself. Are you healthy enough to come to campus to work and learn? This is the Panthers Protecting Panthers app. Every day as we now begin repopulating the campus, 
uh, moving from remote learning and working to, again, convening on our campuses and sites to work and learn together, we're asking ourselves, am I healthy enough to do this today? And this is very un-American, right? Americans are really good about coming to work when we're sick. And we are realizing that that is just not a good um, value to continue to promulgate in, American, uh, in the American workforce. So that um, uh, screener just uh, uh, re reinforces the uh, questions that the CDC asks us to think about, am I healthy enough to come to work today? If you answer and everything is okay, it will say green. And that will say, come on in and do your job or come on in and learn. Supervisors and uh, are, are uh, alerted when people are green. They're also alerted when people are red. And here is when the opportunity comes for the COVID response team. The COVID response team is five, uh, currently stands at five public health professionals that have been hired to do contact tracing and tracking of our Panthers that test positive. These are uh, professionals who have experience and understand how to help guide people to respond about where they were, who they may have been exposed to, and then in turn call those people who have close contacts so that they can quarantine and be guided to testing. Um, it, is, it was a pleasure to assemble this team. We had more than 300 applicants who wanted to work with FIU in this capacity. I'm so pleased to share with you that most of them that have been hired are FIU master's prepared public health students. And um, it's extraordinary what our university has produced as far as value to this community um, from the College of Public Health. Um, so the, the university, if you come to see the university at this time, there's been a tremendous amount of investment in signage, um, in physically preparing the university for repopulation. So you will see that they have cordoned off seating, that chairs have been removed inside of classrooms. We have changed the physical plant of this, of MMC and BBC and our sites to help us reinforce the public health measures um, that are recommended by the CDC. We also have been uh, working collaboratively with our facilities folks to understand contemporary and effective disinfection measures. And when the COVID response team um, uh, sees that there needs to be a disinfection site, there is timely communication to facilities and appropriate measures are taken. Dr. Roldan spoke about our CLIA lab. One of the, the, um, the uh, opportunities we had from the president and the provost was to set up a CLIA. CLIA is a accrediting body that gives uh, labs the, uh, the green light to be able to do complex testing for people. We have many research labs at FIU. None of them are CLIA because they were set up for research, not for clinical use. And so we, this was a, a great lift uh, through a collaboration of the College of Medicine and the College of Public Health to come together and quickly have the expertise to be able to do our own PCR testing, the gold standard for coronavirus. And that lab will begin to function in October. We will be able to do between 250 and uh, 500 tests daily. We happily, again, we have hired our own postdoctoral uh, students who are now uh, trained to do this work and will be working in the lab under the uh, supervision of two of our very um, best scientists, Dr. Mariana Baum and Dr. Eileen Marty. Um, this is again subsidized through CARES money as it is viewed as integral for student success, the ability to get quick test results and make sure that students in housing, students in research cohorts, uh, our student athletes and other what we're calling close proximity panthers are safe to work and, and learn together. Finally, we are the, uh, amassing data from all of the different ventures uh, and mitigating efforts uh, to put together a population health dashboard that is helpful to the university and its leaders as it makes decisions about flexing the population. We fully understand that there may be times where we need, need to retreat as well as open over the next 18 months. And these, this dashboard will be critical to our leaders and to groups like this 
for uh, informing and giving insight to our leaders about how we flex. Um, and I, I'm happy to answer any particular questions that any of you have. It has been a pleasure, as I stated, to work with the experts inside the university to quickly set up what I think is a state-of-the-art mitigating strategy. Um, and right now we can share with you, as Dr. Um, Roldan did, at the rates among students that are being tested at Student Health, the rates amongst faculty that are being tested at the ACC, and the rates among um, housing students that are being tested all below the county average. And so we are pleased with that, and we are pleased with the support that we're able to give our Panthers as they go through what is essentially a very <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. And uh, I know that we're running a little late, uh, but at this time, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to, uh, uh, to Thank Pete. Thank Thanks, you. Andy. Yeah, I think have faith. We have some quick updates. We'll still get done. Uh, we should get done before three, probably 10 minutes to spare. So what I would like to do, well, first of all, I want to thank all of our speakers, you know, Dr. Roldan, Dr. Hernandez Suarez, uh, Michelle Palacio, Casey, President Rosenberg, Sergio. So great updates, um, even more comprehensive than we could have hoped for. So now what I want to do is turn it over to um, and introduce our, my committee leaders from the various committees, and I'm going to have each one of them give you a quick, you know, three to five minute update, starting with A.J. Meyer, um, who heads up our membership committee. He's going to go first, <laughs> and then he's going to turn it over to uh, Jerry Fernandez. Jerry's been uh, a, a stalwart of our philanthropy committee and leads our fine and dine efforts. He's going to talk a little bit about what we're, how we're pivoting that. Then we're going to turn to General Almeida Rodriguez, who has led the, 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 the committee formerly known as WAFA, uh, which is the Real Triumphs um, Award Committee, and then turn it over to Monique, who's gonna talk a bit about membership and the survey results. Um, and then Mel's gonna finish it out with some local advocacy, um, and then turn it back over to me and, and then we should be ready to go. So, okay, AJ, I'm gonna turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete, I appreciate it. And uh, as, as expected, uh, timing always works out perfectly. It's his time, not ours. And so if you hear a boy's voice in the background, bear with me. I'm actually picking up my five-year-old right now from school. Uh, but good afternoon. I am AJ Meyer. I run and, and I'm vice president of uh, business development at a &F Group, which is a construction and development company here in South Florida. Uh, but I also have the honor of serving as your membership chair for the President's Council and uh, very thankful for Pete and the entire team uh, for thinking of me for that role. So with that, uh, my role specifically is to advise members on the opportunities and responsibilities of their membership. I also monitor activity of members with the aim of maximizing uh, that membership experience. This year, part of my goals is to include expanding our membership base to ensure we continue to flourish as FIU's premier community relations board and hopefully get us into that top 50 sooner rather than later. Currently, there are 85 active members on the board, and I'd like to challenge everyone here that's on the Zoom call still to nominate at least two prospects to serve along with us on the President's Council and to deliver our goals and mission. Explore your network and think of community leaders and business leaders that you feel would be a great addition to our board. Remember, diversity and inclusion are core values for us at FIU, and it's critical that the President's Council, that our organization, that our group, incorporate these values into all aspects of our work. Let us consider nominating members that have diverse professional backgrounds, age, ethnicity, and gender. We encourage you to nominate a prospect by completing the electronic nomination form at go.fiu.edu backslash PC nomination. It's a simple form, takes you a few minutes, you enter their contact information. After the review, the nominee receives a packet that provides them with detailed information on the council, and you will be an integral part of the entire process and informed along the way. Uh, we just need them to be passionate about our Panther community and what FIU stands for. I hope to review many of those nominations in the upcoming months alongside both Pete and Sandy, again, with your involvement along the way. We're also launching a new PC website feature on our website 
uh, for a list of upcoming events. It'll showcase our past virtual events so you can easily access and share them on your social media cha uh, channels. Uh, it's also important that your member profiles are updated. Please review these components on our member directory on the website. When we invite and recommend new members, many of them look at the website, look at the current members and their profiles. So please take 10 minutes out of your day, take a look at your profile and ensure that it's up to date. And you can update your information by going to go.fiu.edu backslash PC contact or simply email us the information at prescount at fiu.edu and we can update your profile. Uh, lastly, give us a follow on our new LinkedIn page that was recently updated. This is where we'll be sharing major university announcements and highlighting our board members. It's also a great way to share PC content. And lastly, as you can see from my picture, I'm driving. And so those individuals in that photo are a lot more appealing to the eye than I am. And also, I'm dreaming every night about restarting the FIU football season. That said, I'd like to pass it on to our next executive committee member, Mr. Jerry Fernandez. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Uh, hi, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, um, I am the current philanthropy chair. It used to be called the uh, FPP chair. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I think, I've, I think everybody has been involved over the last few years. For the last three years, we've been doing the Vine and Dine, um, raising money for fostering Panther Pride. Uh, last year, the Vine and Dine event uh, in the spring, uh, it's 100, we, we made $136,000. Uh, it was a great, great effort by everybody. Uh, special thanks to Joseph Salberg. Steve Marin Jr., Adriana Perez, Pereira Reyes, and Lydia Harrison, of course, they, they were great contributors. Um, we are no longer be, gonna be uh, working with the FPP. Uh, we're gonna be moving to a different uh, cause, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but over the, over the time we've been working with the Fostering Panther Pride program, uh, with all the matches and all the money we've raised, We've gotten to over $2 million in, in funding for, for Fostering Panther Prize. So we're very proud of that. And uh, everybody here had a big hand to play in that. So I want to thank everybody for their efforts on that. Um, this year so far, uh, for our new, new initiative, uh, we've raised $75,000. Uh, we're looking forward to, to re-envisioning to, uh, re Vine and Dine in the spring. Hopefully by that time, we can all get together again and do that again. Um, and we didn't get to do it this year, but hopefully we'll be doing that in 2021. Uh, the initiative we're working on this year is the uh, Panther Protection Fund. And uh, we'll be getting some information out to the whole PC about the specifics of that, uh, of that fund. But basically, it's a student emergency aid fund. So one of the biggest things we see with uh, students who end up dropping out and uh, not finishing their education uh, is some catastrophic event. It's similar to, to a, a lot of what affected the, the fostering Panther Pride students. When you're in your, you know, uh, some, some you know, your, your car breaks down, you can't, you don't have transportation, you have some minor, some emergency, not minor, but emergency with housing or with your family or something that requires you to immediately get some funds that doesn't allow you maybe to, to finish that quarter, or finish that semester. Um, this fund is gonna be one that allows you to, uh, to, to, to stay in school, because what we found with students is once they leave, uh, for them to come back, it always becomes harder and harder. So we'll get information out to the group on the uh, Panther Protection Fund, but that's going to be our new initiative that we're looking forward to to uh, to working with this year. Um, we're going to be starting hopefully uh, a new virtual mixology event. Uh, we're scheduling that for October 16th. We'll be sending uh, the information out to everybody. Uh, it's called Craft. Um, everybody's going to pick up some packages, do some mixology at home. We'll all get a chance to do that together. Uh, so that's going to be able to, that's going to be um, on, uh, on October 16th. So we'll get some more information to you guys out on that. So that's basically, that's my update. Like I said, we, we couldn't have our fine and dine this year. It was a, a shame, uh, but we're going to get back into it next year and uh, hopefully restarting events. Um, uh, you know, sometime, sometime in the spring. Uh, one of the things we're noticing is there is an anxiety, there is some anxiousness for people to get together. So there's a lot of pent up demand out there. So hopefully once this, uh, uh, sometime early, in the, sometime in the spring, we can get all get together and, and take advantage of it for, uh, 
for Vine and Dine and some other things to get together. So um, that's just a quick update. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jennifer Almeida Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Jerry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Almeida Rodriguez. I am a uh, attorney at Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney. I'm the head of the Miami office and I'm your chair for the President's Council Worlds Ahead Faculty Award Committee. It's so great to have heard from our leadership today and to see so many familiar faces. In the last few months, you may have recognized that there have been a few changes related to the university's brand elements. FIU is in the process of revitalizing its brand from Worlds Ahead to the Real Campaign. And so as a result, we will be renaming our Worlds Ahead Faculty Award to the Real Triumphs Faculty Award in an effort to support the new branding initiative by the university. I'd like to take a very uh, quick moment to just review exactly what the Real Triumphs Faculty Award is for our new members. Through this award, uh, the President's Council recognizes the university's academic achievements for its dedicated faculty. The committee members meet twice to select the finalists. The award recipient receives a cash award of $15,000, which is a product of your President's Council dues. This is a highly coveted award amongst our faculty, and it is uh, really uh, just a great way to get involved with the President's Council. Uh, committee members after the selection process are invited to the Faculty Convocation Award Ceremony and Dinner, where the award recipient is honored this year, many faculty expressed that they were adjusting to remote instruction and busy preparing for the first week of class with these uh, unprecedented circumstances that we're all facing. So we understood that uh, the, the stress that the faculty was under was only going to be compounded if we were pressuring them to submit a nomination packet uh, right around the time that classes were scheduled to start for the university. So as a result, the Real Triumphs uh, Faculty Award was postponed uh, and we are going to be revisiting it in the spring. Our hope is that the postponement is going to allow them sufficient time to gather the required supporting materials and really submit strong uh, nomination packets as we have seen through uh, many, many years uh, serving on this committee. We, we really have some amazing nominations every year and our job gets more and more difficult to narrow it down. As a result, the application is going to reopen in the spring of 2021, and we are going to have two award recipients that will be selected and honored during the fall 2021 convocation ceremony and dinner. I encourage you to consider participating on the committee for the spring. It's a rewarding process. We always learn so much about the university's renowned faculty uh, please reach out to me or any of the community relations team members if you're interested in serving. And now I'd like to pass it on to our next executive committee member, Monique Katojo. You're on. Okay, am I there on now? Uh, you're on mute. You're good. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Monique Katojo. I'm the CEO of Ill Illumined Life Leadership and uh, the chair of the events committee. And as many of you know, since March, um, we have transitioned all of our events and programming to be virtual. But even with that, we've been uh, really successful. Uh, we started what has become a, a community roundtable series hosted by the PC, and we've covered um, various topics from being a healthy leader, which was the one that I, uh, you know, presented for all of you, um, to the current state of the hospitality and the tourism industry. Uh, many of our PC members um, have served as panelists and uh, special guests in these roundtables, and we've had um, close to a thousand people <laughs> um, register and attend these events. So we're, we're really proud of that and we wanna keep it going. Um, we plan to continue hosting these events um, in an effort to highlight university programs and initiatives. And I really wanna encourage each of you uh, to attend these so that you can stay informed on everything uh, that the university is doing and help us to continue uh, to tell mm -hmm. the FIU story. 
Um, also, remember that you can share these invitations with, um, with colleagues, with family members, with friends in the community, um, so that we can all network together and, and really celebrate FIU. Um, and we also invite you to consider inviting someone who you feel could be um, a potential member of the PC, and we'd love to get to know them. And with that, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about um, the PC member survey that we invited everyone to take um, early this year. So let's go ahead and look at slide number one. So as you can see here, 37% um, of our current members um, expressed that they were often involved with PC um, events. And of course, we want to see that number go up. Um, let's go to slide number two. So participants also expressed that uh, dinner with President Rosenberg and invitations to lectures, to conferences, signature events like the wine uh, festival and advocacy briefings were all events that interested them the most. So we're listening. Um, let's go to slide number three. Okay, we also quickly realized that conflicts with schedules um, was the number one reason why members have not been able to participate in some of our events, which makes a lot of sense considering all of the changes that we've all had to make uh, professionally and personally. Uh, some of the feedback that we've received from several of you is that you'd like a virtual component uh, to future in-person events. Uh, we've definitely read all of your feedback. We're taking it into consideration and uh, planning a variety of, of events that include President Rosenberg, uh, virtual networkers, and additional community roundtables. Okay, slide number four. Okay, so before I close, um, I would like to share with you some of these tentative dates. Make sure you write them down, add them to your calendars, and um, we'd love to see you there. So the first thing that we have um, coming up, we're going to talk more about the advocacy briefing um, in, just a, in just a minute. Uh, but we want to invite you to the homecoming caravan on Saturday, October 10th. It's at 3.30 p.m. And you'll see students, faculty, alumni, employees, retirees um, of the FIU community. Uh, they're going to deck out their cars and um, in Panther Pride, and we're going to drive together around campus uh, to celebrate another homecoming season. So I, I hope that you'll be there and join us and President Rosenberg. As Jerry stated just a few minutes ago, craft, the craft event will take place on Friday, October 16th. And our upcoming roundtables will include discussions on diversity in the workplace and more in depth, the discussion on our fundraising initiative, which we shared. So thank you so much. And it's now my pleasure to pass it on to Melissa Tapanes. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Melissa Tapanes here. Uh, great to see you all. Um, I had the pleasure of being your President's Council Chair for three years. I am quite missing that role, but Pete is doing a great job. So thank you so much, Pete, for leading our group through this um, really exceptional time. Uh, now I serve as co-chair of the Advocacy Committee along with uh, Sergio Abreu, um, who gave uh, quite an update earlier uh, during this meeting. Um, as tenure um, as chair of the board, what I really wanted to concentrate on was maximizing the synergy between government, business, and alumni. So now on as advocacy co-chair, I will continue uh, with those efforts. Um, we started, as you many of you attended, the annual President's Council DC fly-in. Uh, this was an immersive experience that gave us all the opportunity to explore our national initiative and priorities, engage with our DC partners and alumni, as well as meet members of our FIU Washington DC offices. And I see you, Carlos Becerra, it was great to see you in DC. And I'm really hoping that uh, by springtime next year, uh, we can be up with our friends in FIU DC once again. 
Um, so I'm looking forward to working with Michelle and Sergio on our governmental relations team um, to really um, coalesce um, our support of our local priorities. Uh, we heard earlier today about our effort in the city of Miami Beach dealing with the Wolfsonian, and I look forward to hearing more about this and many of our other national, state, and local priorities at our upcoming advocacy briefing scheduled for, as Monique said, um, we're hoping to get it down for September 29th or 30th. So um, these briefings are very helpful. It helps to get us all on the same page uh, dealing with current legislation that impacts our community, our world, and most importantly, um, our FIU. So it's really important that we all have the knowledge to uh, deal with all the changes before us in local, state, and national government. So I really hope to connect with you all um, in the days, weeks, and months ahead and working together uh, for FIU. So with that, I'll pass it over to Pete. Great. All right. Thanks, Mel. Thanks for kind of rounding out our team. What a great committee, a set of committee leaders, and they're all doing a phenomenal job. So can't thank everyone. Can't thank uh, everyone enough for taking the time, including you, for taking this almost two hours. We're right at the home stretch. I think I have maybe one slide, and then we're going to go right to the to the video, yeah? Okay, I just wanted to remind folks here, you know, we're all President's Council members, but really kind of, what does that mean? So just briefly, our primary role is to serve as FIU's brand ambassadors. That's first and foremost, which really means helping FIU amplify the messages the, that are happening out there. The news about the university, leveraging our own, our own social media channels, um, talking to people, bringing them in to attend events, so, you know, first and foremost, serving as brand ambassadors, promoting the programs, activities, and achievements, just becoming educated on them and letting people know about them as you come in contact with them. Um, bring your friends and other community leaders <coughs> and invite them to events. We, Monique mentioned, hey, we're doing these roundtables. We just started inviting members of the county, uh, alumni, I mean, you name it. And we just really started getting a lot of folks coming to these events and they're all being branded with President's Council, which is great because it just helps us continue to establish kind of our brand as a leader and a brand ambassador. So um, Mark is every, every quarter or so, we have opportunities for either lunches or dinners or breakfasts or other events um, to, to weigh in on things uh, like <coughs> this Wolfsonian expansion plan. So I think that's a, a great opportunity. Um, and then, you know, Jerry mentioned uh, while, while we are not a fundraising board at all, Jerry mentioned that, you know, there's always opportunities for us to help on key things that Mark wants to get done. Um, and whatever the latest kind of call to action is, just leveraging our networks and bringing, maybe, maybe it's corporate matching that our company might have or whatever it may be, um, to, uh, you know, to, or sponsoring a table at a Vine and Dine or something like that, are ways to raise funds. And we've been able to, thanks to efforts from Jerry, um, and others <laughs> do a phenomenal job of doing this. So that's that's my kind of quick commercial on President's Council, just a reminder of kind of what we're about. And now um, I think we're, we're and we're gonna share, by the way, this recording in, in our next upcoming newsletter. So if you if you had to leave early or missed any of it, you'll be able to get, get it, or you can also pass it on to friends. So, uh, and now we're gonna play our special surprise jam that reflects what FIU is all about and it is written by our very own alumnus, Benny Williams. You ready? Pause up. Yeah. For those of you that want to know what FIU is all about, it's like this. FIU's 10% skill, 20% gotta, 15% concentrated power colada, 5% respect, 50% bold, and 100% the reason we rep the blue and gold. From sun blazers to Rory, ready to tell the story. Starting in 65, they filled with all the glory. Three bowls in a row, learning across the globe. Student diversity, this is the place that you should know. Began with just one tower, this our time, this is our hour. Dine in GC and experience our panther power. You heard of BBC? Kicking it by the seas, might visit Aquarius, located next to the Keys. We're the 305, 
Tootie, the home team, repping 305. You know that's just literally from humble beginnings, but not how we end. There's about 142 countries in our blend. A melting pot, international's our middle name. Once you're a panther, look, we're all just the same. Creating special strides, leaping until we soar. Fostering panther pride for those who warm, hear us roar. This is 20% flair, 80% grit, be 100% emerging and never willing to quit. High scoring on the bar, students learning the law. I can hear the president yelling out, Mazel tov, on our way to top 50. Send up a new solution, while the wind to blow you away and cancel pollution. We have more programs than any school can say. Finishing four years, everybody knows the way. FIU's 10% skill, 20% percent gotta 15 percent concentrated power colada five percent respect 50 percent vote and 100 percent the reason we rep the blue and gold i use 10 percent skill 20 percent gotta 15 percent concentrated power colada five percent respect 50 percent vote and 100 percent the reason we rep the blue and gold supposedly we have some competition but the best school in south florida doesn't see the opposition we're known to be Global with our mission, croquet down straight from Vicky's fried to great condition. When you talk about greatness, don't forget the blue and gold. 8th and 107 Ave has become our second home. With a friend like Rory, you can never feel alone. Welcome to Panther Hall, just know this building's always cold. But with the trail of torch, you will always feel the heat. Give light to generations that will keep the legacy. Keep it moving. And don't you ever lose the trust. And this FIU family, they won't let you give up. FIU's 10% skill, 20% gotta, 15% concentrated power colada, 5% respect, 50% mold, and 100% the reason we rep the blue and gold. FIU's 10% skill, 20% gotta, 15% concentrated power colada, 5% respect, 50% mold, and 100% the reason we rep the blue and gold. So... Did that help you? Do you finally know what this university is all about? I have one request and one request only. We're FIU. Remember the name. All right, awesome. Okay, everybody, that wraps. Take your, it's three o'clock, find your cortadito or your colada, go wake yourself back up again and have a great rest of the day. All right, love to all of you, Bye, stay Pete. safe. Stay safe, thanks Mel. Stay safe, everybody.